This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 482, recorded on February 23rd, 2018. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in New York City, Dixon Depomier. Hello there, Vincent. Not a nice day. It's a lot. In fact, from your window, I can usually see New Jersey, but I can't now. Four degrees Celsius cloudy. It's At foggy. least it's not 70 degrees. Again. No, but I, I, I'll take a two more. Much. We'll I'll see. take two more of those. Joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Hi, it's good to be here. Similar weather. It's gray and rainy and foggy and 34 and um, and two days ago it was 73. Isn't that amazing? Sunny and clear. It's yeah. quite remarkable. Joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Kathy? I am pulling up the weather even as we speak, although I can mm-hmm. see it's just one big cloud and it's 48 <laughs> degrees Fahrenheit. And that 48, is, that's warm. Well, or 46, and that's eight Celsius. And almost 100% humidity, I take it. Uh, it's not raining now, but it's wet out there. Yeah. Right, right. We just discovered in the class I teach at um, Fordham that when it rains an inch of water and you have a roof that's 70 feet by 40 feet, just the, just the parameters, not the eaves are not flat. 6,000 gallons of water fall on your roof. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's incredible. Yep. (laughs) It's a lot of weight. It's a lot of weight. It's a lot of water if you could collect it, too. That was what we were talking about. You could. That's a a very traditional thing to do. Yeah. I actually had had a a distant cousin in Mississippi who who lived, well, it wasn't called off the grid in those days. It was just. Off the grids. Yeah. I mean, he just, uh, that's, he didn't know any other way. So, and he had a. um, uh, the cistern and the whole yep. thing. And then I showed them pictures of Bermuda and none of the class had ever been to Bermuda. I said, do you see those nice white roofs? They're not just roofs. There's and grooves. They roofs? They're grooves Groove? in the roof grooves? and they're all white because they're all bleached white to keep. So, so you can tell where the yeah, dirt is. Is that correct? Uh-huh. Roofs? Oh I think it's roofs. yeah. Roofs, roofs. I think be roofs growing too. up where I did, I've, I've <laughs> said both. Okay. Right. <laughs> Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. <laughs> Hi, I'm happy to be back. Welcome well, back. Brand. It's been Good to have like, you back. Like when were you here last? Do you remember? Uh, I think sometime in the fall. And you were ah. teaching, right? I was teaching. Yes. That that course over. That course is over. Now I have a new uh, set of courses on slate. <laughs> what are you teaching this semester? Uh, I am teaching immunology, microbiology, and a molecular genetics lab. Good lord! Wow. Uh, yeah. So it happens at a teaching school, right? It is, but it's lots of fun. You so like that's it, okay. Very good. I do like it a lot. Um, and it is 38 here and rainy. Right. Mm. And you can't see New York from where you are. I either. can't see New York either. <laughs> no. So neither one of us knows that we're actually here. I mean, we just say that we're here, but we could be anywhere. It's true. Yes. Where can science, technology, engineering, and mathematics STEM take you this April? Discover. How STEM can take you into outer space, under the microscope, and beyond with the USA Science and Engineering Festival, presented by Lockheed Martin. The expo takes place April 7th and 8th at the Washington, D.C. Convention Center. Attendees can explore over 3,000 hands-on science activities with hundreds of organizations like the American Society for (laughs) Microbiology, NASA, Chevron, Georgetown University, Honda, SpaceX, and more. Registration SpaceX. is required. Nice. Visit usasciencefestival.org to register today. Wow. Is that Elon Musk's company? Uh-huh. Yeah, that's the one. It is. Which is uh, Am- Jeff Bezos. What's the name of that one? I think it's, that's Amazon. Uh, that's called that's Amazon. Amazon. That's right. <laughs> uh, he, has a space, he has a space spinoff. Oh, right. Bezos... Space. Yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't hype it nearly blue, as much. Blue as Musk something. Does. Blue. Uh-huh. Blue, blue origin. origin. Blue origin. Huh. If I ever started a company, I would call it Origin of Replication. <laughs> or how about Ori Inc. <laughs> Ori Inc. Speaking of companies, I just 
someone sent me an email. She had had her fecal contents um, analyzed by this company called Viome, V-I-O-M-E, and say they, they send you back how, what bacteria you have, what viruses, and she was concerned because she had a lot of plant viral RNA. <laughs> Well, good for her. Yeah, I said, no problem. Eat more meat, great. that wouldn't happen. <laughs> and then today I got another one. Another person had done this, and he and there's this really unusual bacterium. <laughs> he wanted to know what it was all about. So it's funny that people are doing this, isn't it? <laughs> it's yeah. great. 23 and me. This is called 23 no, billion and me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've done the bacteria, and I recently got an ad asking me to do viruses as well. Really? You, know, you remember the company? Uh, I use one called Microbiome, which uh, is really written as U-Biome. Oh, yes. oh, cool. Yeah. So this one is called Viome. I don't know. Like a lot. No, not video, not Vimeo. Viome. Vimeo. <laughs> uh, Viome. Uh, Viome. dot com. Take back your gut health. So I guess Virome was taken. So they had <laughs> Viro- <laughs> Viome. <laughs> anyway, these people sent me their entire reports, and they compare you to uh, the rest, all the other people. Quite interesting. Life is becoming interesting. Follow up from last time. Jacob writes, hi, TWIV hosts and Vincent's wife. I heard Vincent lament on TWIV 481 that it was not possible yet to repair cartilage with stem cells. And I wanted to draw your attention to a Sydney-based biotech company that is doing exactly that. My goodness. Regenius have a treatment using adipose-derived mesenchymal stem cells injected into the knee to improve cartilage volume and reduce knee pain, which has been widely used in veterinary medicine and has completed stage one clinical trials in humans. Stage two trials are running in Japan, so as Vincent and his wife want to take another trip to Japan (laughs) outside of cherry blossom season, (laughs) obviously. Also, I noticed today that Vincent's Wikipedia page is kind of short. Can the TWIV army help him out? Thanks, Jacob. So you can tell Jacob is, I, I don't know, either from Australia or the UK, because he says they the company have a treatment, right? Yep, I noticed that too. <laughs> Virginia's yes. have a treatment. <laughs> Genius.com.au. How about that? You say something is impossible, and then the listeners tell you it sure is so. Exactly. I haven't told my wife yet about this. Hmm. I would love to go back to Japan, though. Yeah. So there you go. Kathy, can you take the next one? Sure. Johnny writes, please don't give up picks. You and many listeners have provided fascinating, beautiful, inspiring, and legal, parentheses, mind-expanding trips to unknown wonders in world that surround us. Your collective and individual knowledge and passion for the sweet mysteries of life, as you must know, is infectious and highly contagious. It's in the community now. Can't put it back in the test tube. <laughs> Johnny. <laughs> All right. As long as one person likes it, that's what I say. That's it. There yep. we go. We'll that's leave right. them in. Alan. April says, or writes, okay, ironically, you guys mispronounced Gonzaga, the university. The correct correct pronunciation of the first A is a long A. I live in Spokane. I'm a botanist, and my favorite beginner botany book is called Botany in a Day, The Pattern Method of Plant Identification by Thomas Elpel. Hmm. Um, Okay, thank you for the recommendation. There are a couple of long A's, as Kathy has has pointed out in this note here. Um, I had learned it from Gonzaga students as Gonzaga. Am I wrong? No, I had that's learned correct. from college basketball as Gonzaga. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. they had, that's how I, it is in the in the uh, funny video that is in okay. this link that I put in. But to me, long A from elementary school meant A like in aim a, and yes. enable. It should be Gonzaga, which is not correct. No. no. What did we but I when think I, when I was the mispronunciation college, had, was Gonzaga, and that's right. totally wrong. When I was in college, they had an excellent debate team, and maybe they still do, but they were certainly well-known. And they have a good basketball team, too. Yes, they do. I've heard of them, too. Gonzaga? Gonzaga. 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 A as in in bath. Bath, trap, yak, and Spokane. Rack and yellow? So that line about, yeah, that, too. (laughs) It's the line, I live in Spokane, is actually part of the video as well. So yeah. uh, that's a hard one for me. I'll take, I'll let someone else do it next time <laughs> we come across it. It's just one of those things. Uh, I'm now at the age where I will not remember. Really? Gonzaga. Gonzaga. Mm-hmm. Rack and yellow. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah, rack and yellow. Gonzaga, rack and yellow. <laughs> okay. On to snippet. 
We have Snippet and Paper today. The Snippet is a true Snippet. Snippet and Paper. That's a yeah, name. I think we could do It's a specialty this. store. If, as you know, a Snippet is supposed to be no more than 15 minutes, according to what? Yeah, I know. <laughs> so <there's> no <laughs> but um, sure. some of them go on for actually an hour and longer than the actual main paper. But this one, I think, can be snippetized. Yes. Uh, this is from so. the Journal of Infectious Diseases. And it is entitled Serologic Evidence of Ebola Virus Infection in a Population with No History of Outbreaks in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And now we can move to our main paper. <laughs> it's, it's, that's the bottom line, yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Sabwe Mulangu is the first author. Is there two first authors? Got two A's there. Let's mm-hmm. see. Yep, first author, Sal- Sabwe Mulangu and Vivian Alfonso. And the last author is Anne Ramoyne. And this comes from the National Institutes of Health, the Kinshasa School of Public Health. Um, um, Okay, and then the Institut National de Recherche Biomedicale in Kinshasa. So um, this follows up from a conversation we had a long time ago about how, how fatal actually is Ebola virus infection. You know, there have been over 25 outbreaks since 1976, they tend to be pretty lethal, you know, 25 to 90%, depending on which virus and where it's happening. And there have been a number of previous serological surveys. So you just take the population, you look in their serum and ask who has antibodies to Ebola and doesn't remember having Ebola virus disease or is still alive. <laughs> and, you know, anywhere from from 25 to 15% of these participants in previous studies in countries throughout Africa are seropositive. And this is the biggest one that's been done to date. Now you ask, why is this interesting? Well, first of all, you'd like to know if they're inapparent or minimally symptomatic infections, right? And, right. you know, we also give you some idea on how the virus is moving around populations and so forth. Mm-hmm. So this one, mm-hmm. 3,000... 440 people. Three, uh, 3,415 or 34? A lot. Yeah, over yeah. 3,000 people, 3,400 some odd people. In the, um, in the DRC, it is the Sankuru District, which is in the Kasai Oriental Province. And these were sampled uh, some time ago. Um, 2007, 2007. August, August to September. And that was at about the same time there was an outbreak not too far away, right? Yes. I'm looking at this map here. Um, I don't know how many miles it would be. A thousand kilometers away? Where's, uh, oh, my, oh, my, oh, my, oh, my highlighting ran away. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, yeah, so uh, there, were, there were already three outbreaks in the DRC. There was one ongoing in 2007 in Mueca and Luebo. So Mueca and Luebo, yeah, it's kind of close. It's very close to Coles. Yes. It's probably yeah, about a hundred kilometers. Yeah, it's very close. There's a scale up at the top in the map. Right. Yeah. Now they they don't say anything about what the terrain is like. Nope. So a hundred kilometers, you know, across a grassy plain is different from a hundred kilometers through a mountainous jungle, and I think this may be a little closer to the latter, but it's it's close. Anyway, overall, 11% seropositive. The, w- the way they did the assay in a lysof-based format, they make Ebola virus nucleoprotein. They stick it on plastic. They pass the serum on top. You add anti-IgG with peroxidase, and you can do a chromogenic reaction. And so we're looking for capture IgG. Capture, Lysa. A capture. A capture. A capture. Yes. A capture. And um, 11%. Previous work has shown that this is a, this is a sensitive and specific Test. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, and they talk a little bit about um, what they define as backgrounds, and they are being pretty conservative here. You yeah. have mm-hmm. to have quite a few antibodies uh, before you're counted as positive right. um, in this assay. And these are people who clearly are alive and don't recall having had any Ebola virus hemorrhagic fever. Um, and so then they did some other interesting analysis, which is what do these individuals do? And what makes you at risk for being seropositive for, for Ebola virus? And one of them is getting older. So over 15 years of age, you have a higher risk. Being male has a higher risk of being seropositive. And animal exposures, visits to the forest, hunting, butchering and skinning animals, picking up dead animals and eating them, <laughs> cooking and eating, <laughs> um, 
Well, these sorts of things are um, make you more likely, and also uh, the the people who are closer to the outbreak were more likely to be seropositive, if I recall, right? They yes. Didn't yes. Get, yeah, they was, didn't get sick. It's not a dramatic correlation, but it is a it is a trend in the graphs. The villages that were closer in. They even have what kind of animals these individuals were exposed to. Yes. That part's yes, really so, interesting. It <laughs> is. So rodents rodents apparently correlated and uh, dikers, which is a little miniature deer type yes. animal. Antelope huh. type. A diker. Is it do you have any pictures of those Dixon? Didn't no. see them where I was. I don't think they are a native to the south part hmm. of Africa. But they also look what's a eutheria? <clears throat> Good question. <laughs> I thought you knew these things. <laughs> Uh, oh, I'll answer that in the next class. <laughs> non-human primates, wild birds, wild boar, bat. A eutheria. Lorises. Slow loris. Remember the slow loris? Oh, good for wild cats, reptiles, and elephants. Where's the right, process? So the, that's what? a whole clade in the in the mammals. Right. The lorises. The the, or, well, the, oh, the e- eutheria yeah. are, are a whole. Yeah, and, and it says in the footnotes it includes uh, pangolin and elephant shrews. Uh, it's very interesting that people recall what they encounter, right? I guess when you when you live close to the forest, you get used to you what's live, there. Yeah, right? I mean, if you sure. think about it, if I, I live in a you know a suburb, so I don't have a whole lot of forest contact, but I could tell you what I saw out the window. I could tell you what I saw walking down the street. Yep, I see. Now, I know we have wild turkeys and this and that. And if if yeah. I were hunting or butchering or or eating things, I'd probably remember that. Yeah. And so that is the uh, the result. Now the question here is. Why wasn't there an outbreak in this area that's right. 11% seropositive, right? And we don't know. Were these people a little bit sick or not sick at all, which is interesting. Was it Ebola virus? We, you know, This is probably a specific test, but one could argue that maybe there's something very close that's giving you seropositivity. Or maybe even a strain sort of like Reston Ebola that doesn't, yeah. uh, isn't really known to cause clinical disease. Right. Could be, although that hasn't been seen very often. <laughs> Right. But it could be a related strain that is mm-hmm. a, not pathogenic. Dikers aren't seen very often either. No. <laughs> but the, now in the the last outbreak in West Africa, remember, a really big one, um, they did do some serology on contacts of people who were sick. And they had about, a, what is it, 9% seropositivity in uh-huh. these individuals who were not yeah. sick. So it could be even in the context of an outbreak, you have a certain fraction of people that are minimally or asymptomatic, right? Yeah, there was actually a commentary on this article in the same yes. issue, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it talks about that quite a bit. Um, it says 6.5% in one study and 2.6% in That's another right. study. That's right. Those are the numbers, yeah. So, And these, by the way, are both open access, and the, um, yeah. the paper and the commentary are both quite good. So it's interesting that there are these, these levels of seropositivity and no outbreaks. So it makes you wonder if this is, you know, well, this is Zaire Ebola virus they were looking at. Um, if this is Zaire Ebola virus seropositivity, uh, what does it take to have an outbreak, right? Yeah. And I think a long time ago, I wrote a blog post about these older studies, and Alan made the comment that maybe when you acquire the virus from hunting tweakers or whatever you hunt, <laughs> you get you get a different kind of inoculation than if you get it from a patient that's in your house or something like that. You remember that blog post, Alan? I, uh, you <laughs> linked to it, and I went back to it. I said, oh, yeah, I did say that, didn't <laughs> he I? He wrote it in wow. the comments, yeah. That's not a, not a horrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> Even today. Um, yeah, so, so, you know, somebody's butchering an animal and they get blood-to-blood contact with it because they nicked themselves with a knife or they had an uh, open wound. That would be one type of exposure, or you could maybe inhale a small inoculum or get it, an oral inoculum of it, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. maybe these these types of exposures, the exposure route could matter, because as we know, the exposure route matters for yeah. uh, for the virus's infection. Um, the commentary with this raises a couple of uh, really important points that... Um, uh, they say a few intrinsic assumptions not often discussed require unpacking, and one is um, <laughs> this: we call these these asymptomatic cases, but that's turns out to be a really hard term to nail down, especially in an area where you've got endemic malaria and other diseases. Well, have you had this illness that causes these, you know? Uh, malaise and fever and and this and that and uh, that was Ebola. Well, 
no, you know, I've had malaria or this or that, but I've never, I've never had Ebola. Well, how do you know you've never had Ebola? Right. Yeah. Yep. Maybe these people had. And then the other thing, which, but, but if uh, they did, they didn't have the kind that kills. If they 60%. did, they didn't die. Right. Yeah. Yes, that is true. But there could also be deaths in the community that were of, of unknown causes. Sure. Sure. Um, but then the other, the other thing they point out is we don't know in the cases of the antigen positive folks, you could have cross reaction with something else, or you could have, they could have been exposed to Ebola antigen, but not intact virus. Yep. 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 And they developed an immune response against the, the antigen that's being tested here, but they didn't really get infected. So we don't know that these are infections, but it is an interesting yeah. data point and it's, and we should probably point out that this is a huge and must have been an extremely difficult study. Yeah. So this is a remote area. They talk about uh, the, the languages spoken in the area are Tetela, Lingala, and French. And they, they had to get local interpreters to administer questionnaires. They had to come up with a way of estimating uh, household economic status because these are remote rural villages. And... Um, and so there are just all these complexities, and they did this enormous study, and I, I think kudos for this huge project. No, oh, the fact that the sera were sampled in, what, 2007, and we're just seeing the paper is kind of a hint of that, right? Yes. How what, hard it was. I, which I guess, I, I wasn't entirely sure what that delay was about. Uh, I don't know. I mean, yeah, it was a really hard study to do in terms of getting the questionnaires and, and all that done and getting the sera but I would think that once you had that, the lab part should go pretty quickly. Yeah, it's true. I don't know. Maybe they had to write the grant that many times. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah, or maybe they collected serum and they wouldn't be allowed to leave the country until they got certain permissions. Or maybe they maybe they did it locally and then the guy wouldn't release it. Who knows? What kinds of scenarios? But Maybe the, they c- collected the serum and waited until they had a good ELISA. Maybe. <laughs> Possible. Lots too. of things. Um, the one thing, though, they, there were... So there have been four outbreaks in DRC, some of them kind of small. So I just think if there had been a little mini outbreak, they would have picked it up, right? Even one or two cases. Right. So mm-hmm. uh, I think all the other ex- explanations are probably most likely. Anyway, it's an interesting issue. And what's the answer? We've got to do more of this. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> Especially in an outbreak situation, it would be good to sample lots of people. Of course, that's not a priority when there's an outbreak. Yeah, but that's true would be really interesting. By the way, the last one was 11,000 fatalities out of 15,000 laboratory confirmed cases. That's a lot. That is. That's quite fatal. Yeah. But I still and think about the fact that we don't truly know the denominator. No, that's right. I mean, right. that's yes. laboratory confirmed cases. and Who went to the this- hospital who were sick, right, yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's not the whole population say, let's see who's seropositive in a big right. chunk of it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We don't know the denominator. Well, and there's this whole thing going on with the survivors who have these sequelae that, and pr- possibly still virus in them that we don't know what's going on with that. I think we could use a, I mean, this has been done somewhat, but a really big serostervy of, of animals. Yes. In the forest. Of yes, all absolutely. Sort. That's hard. Very, very hard. Because you can't just ask them for permission. You have to. <laughs> trap them. You remember what they did? I, I think for the, you usually don't bother with the consent. <laughs> yeah, remember what they did for the uh, primate malarias, though? They looked at the feces. They did that for SIV as well. Yeah, yep. Yeah. The the paper we just did in um, TWIP, they the lady in in Santa Barbara caught trapped rats and she just killed them all. <laughs> remember? Yeah. And she I remember. so she trapped them. So right. I don't know if you put a trap if you put a Sherman trap in. Uh, as far as would any would the animals like oh ha huh, are you kidding me <laughs> kind of laughing. I think that's the idea yeah they're smart yeah. okay that's a snippet did we did we do well well yeah, we did very well I think it was like fourteen minutes good <laughs> now the main paper is uh, a paper published in Current Biology it's a report it has an interesting structure it has a summary and then goes right into the results yes kind of liked it. You know, sometimes abstracts and introductions overlap. So I I, I like the um But there was no experiment in this case, right? It was a, a discovery. There are some experiments. In there the are paper. some experiments. Yes. Some. But some. Majority of it was a, a, a I don't know. You know, discovery. a computational biologist would say that what they do is an experiment. <laughs> so I would agree with them. Anyway, this Wait, is um, Yes, sir. Didn't they didn't they do the sequencing? 
<laughs> yes, of course they did the sequel. Yeah. Take. Oh, that's still not an experiment. Dixon, Dixon uh-huh. doesn't consider that an experiment. No, that's so. You know, this harkens back to the days, and Kathy will remember. Maybe even Alan, <laughs> when there is a qualifying exam, we would ask them, "How would you show?" What what um, the mutation is for this phenotype without doing any sequence? Because <laughs> right. the easy answer would be just sequence. Just sequence it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> remember, Kathy? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Do you remember Wire when they gave out uh, Nobel Prizes for sequencing proteins? Yeah. And genomes. Sanger, and genomes. he got two. That's right. Edelman got one for IgG. Yeah. So anyway, this is called the diversity structure and function of heritable adaptive immunity sequences in the 80s Egypti genome. Roger. Zachary Whitfield, Patrick Dolan, Mark Kunitomi, Michelle Tassetto, Matt Seaton, Steve Oak, Cheryl Heiner, Ellen Paxinos, and Raul Andino, who I know is a polio guy at the University of California, San Francisco, right. Stanford University, and very important, Pacific Biosciences. Right. They make the sequencing apparatus that let you do long runs, which Nels Eldy was telling us about a couple of episodes ago, if you remember. Yeah. Great, Brian. Do you have any pack yeah. bio sequencers? Uh, we don't have any pack bio sequencers, although I have been in contact with them to talk about doing some sequencing. They're cool. They're, they're about the size of a harmonica, right? Yeah, and they you are. Get, and you they're get, really cool. And you get long <laughs> runs, although, as, as Nell said, they're kind of error prone. But you right. Get, you right. So real- most most sequencing these days is done on these um, these systems that use a very short read, and then you computationally stitch everything together. Right, which is great if you want to quickly sequence a genome, and they're very efficient, very cheap. Uh, the Pack Bio, what's unique about it is that you can do these much longer reads, and um, the advantage there is that you can often piece together things that, if you were doing the short reads, you wouldn't be able to figure out, especially stuff that's highly repetitive in the genome. Right, because get, the the computational work wouldn't work on the repetitive. Right, right, because uh, if everything sequence. looks the same, what order were they in? We don't know. And that's a problem with mosquito genomes, which uh, are highly, they tend to be highly, highly repetitive. repetitive. So they decided here they wanted to look at mosquito immunity. So they decided to do long runs so they could get a, the complete genome. And that's and, mosquitoes being immune to things, not being immune to mosquitoes. Sadly, we haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> no, you just go to Antarctica, right? Right. <laughs> so mosquito immunity is largely either short interfering RNA based or peewee interacting RNA based. I don't think we've never talked much about peewees here. Peewee <laughs> originally means pea element induced wimpy testis in Drosophila. What a phenotype. Yes. <laughs> That's Low- peewee, P-I-W-I. So that is um, uh, you know, probably the original protein or the gene was named by, based on this phenotype, and it turned out to be involved in the process you'll see today, peewee. So these are RNAs that interact with proteins called peewees. And so you know that short interfering RNAs, when a virus infects a cell, the double-stranded RNA is recognized, it is chopped up, and then used in small pieces, siRNAs, small pieces are used to then target more genomes and chop them up. And peewees are a little different, as you'll see there. They're kind of a there's something in the genome that is transcribed to make peewee RNAs. Um, and here the the key element is what's called EVE, an endogenous viral element. It is not retroviral, okay? It is just, and we've talked about this before on TWIV, other viruses that get reverse transcribed because, because cells do have reverse transcriptase encoded in, for example, transposable elements, and then the RNAs get integrated into the genome. They're not complete copies of viral genomes, but uh, this was first found in a variety of mammalian cells, just pieces of flu and, and real virus RNA just stuck in there, and they are records of previous infections. So that's Now, I'm, cool. I'm getting to an age where I can actually say this happened kind of recently. <laughs> um, <laughs> Which part? The uh, discovery? The, the eaves. The yeah, discovery it is, of the yeah. Eaves. Because it, it was, I remember when the first papers came out with these non-retroviral sequences showing up in in genomes of various types, and people saying, "What the heck is that doing in there?" And yeah, thinking, yeah. Eh, "It's probably some fluke event. There's nothing to it. That's really it's just whatever." Um, and then more and more of this, and now it turns out that we're, I I think what's happening is that we're breaking into this whole other 
room of immunology that we had no clue about before. Yeah. Yes, yes. Th- I found this really interesting as an immunologist, although I also, you know, had some places where I was getting a little picky as an immunologist. <laughs> do you think it's not real immunology? Uh, I do. I question their use of the words adaptive immunity. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. I think you're right about that. Yeah, you're right. So Eves, all right. And so they wanted to look at the Eves in 80s Egypti. And by the way, if this concept of inserting little segments of viruses into the genome and then using them to combat subsequent infections sounds familiar. You may have followed news on CRISPR, which has been <laughs> yeah, right. discussed <laughs> lately. Yeah, similar idea. It's pretty much the same thing. So conceptually. Yeah, just a different machine yes. involved. That's right. So the EVOM is what they call it, which is pretty neat. Yes. The EVOM. And so they do this long run sequencing to try and sort out the EVOM of 80s Egypti because they say before there wasn't a good assembly of it and they um then they take the sequence and they say what virus sequences can we discover here by doing computational searching they found 472 eves in the 80s egypti genome and you thought there was just one at the beginning right i'm joking yes. it's a joke <laughs> yes <laughs> and they, they did the computation on an apple you don't know, <laughs> and, I don't by know the way, enough to is, laugh at that. <laughs> did did we mention this is a this is a cell line yeah. that they're sequencing? Yeah. It's a cell line, yeah. It's not so the it's it is Egypti AAG2 right. cell, cell line. line, not the actual mosquito. Yeah. yeah, I think that's pretty important. And it, yeah. the cell line is from larvae, mm-hmm. um, so they may not have uh, been naturally infected before the cell line was derived. Right. Yeah. Yeah. These these came from the parents, right? Right. Exactly. Dixon, what? Nothing. I'm just thinking of the other branch of the immune response to insects, which is an encapsulation response using hemocytes. Mm -hmm. That's not Mm -hmm. adaptive either, but it's protective nonetheless against larger things like bacteria. It's like an intrinsic defense, right? Yeah, that's right. Exactly right. Yeah, we, we have sort of similar things. But we don't we don't encapsulate. It'd be interesting to see what Wolbachia does to this system, wouldn't it? What do you want to do? Put Wolbachia in here? Yeah, and see if other genes are turned on. Maybe. Anyway, 472 eaves from eight viral families, the ones we know of, mostly from Rhabdoviridae, Flaviviridae, and Chuviridae. <laughs> I didn't think yeah. mosquitoes could chew. Exactly. <laughs> Is this like a Star Wars thing? Chewbacca. <laughs> Chewbacca yes. viridae. If you search, so, if you Google, I, what did you find, Kathy? <laughs> well, if you go to Viral Zone, which is what Rich taught us to do, you get nothing. Yeah. Uh, I was just so surprised. Chewbacca? So then I had to Google, and I got the same thing that uh, someone put into the show notes. So they're negative strand viruses. Mosquitoes, uh, right? Of mosquitoes. Yeah. yeah. It's been a paper that I think we mentioned where they did a lot of virus discovery and found these. Huh. They're, they're, you know, I don't know if anyone actually has viruses, if it's just sequenced so far. Yeah. Uh, anyway, 338,000 base pairs, 50 to 2,500 base pairs in length, these, these eaves. And, uh, you know, not the whole viral genome, but parts of it and asymmetric parts, like more of one part and not another. And they say that suggests that it's actually mRNAs that um, are the template. So what happens here is these mRNAs get reverse transcribed by reverse transcriptase that is produced in the cells. And again, transposable elements like retrotransposons have encode uh, reverse transcriptase in them. That's how they move around the genome. And sometimes that RT will just willy-nilly copy some other RNA including a viral RNA if it gets in there, and then that will in- integrate, and that becomes an Eve. Got that, Dixon? You betcha. And so these are a record of infection. They have lovely graphics to show you, <laughs> yes, you know, the distribution of Eves over rhabdovirus and Chuviridae de- genomes, <laughs> the Chu virus genome. It's like old glycoprotein mostly. It's really interesting. And um, they, they found there was one... Um, that just I, I looked at it and said, what is that doing in there? Grass carp rhabdovirus? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know what that, I, <laughs> maybe it infects other things besides. That's yeah, a fish rhabdovirus. It, it is. It could yeah. be just a sequence hit, right? You know, maybe it's not exact right. and it was the closest thing in the database. I don't know. Right. Yeah, there are a lot of abbreviations on these figures that um, 
require some unpacking. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to do it. But the cool thing is there's dengue in there and um, yellow yeah, fever. There's, there's is there yellow fever? Stuff you would expect. Is there yellow yeah. fever? Better be yellow fever. Pawasan, I see. Yeah, I see it. I see yellow it's, fever virus. Good. It's about the, the seven o'clock on the good. circular there it is. phylogenies, which I have to say, I really don't like circular phy- phylogenies. Yeah. I'll throw my vote in with others that I've seen don't like those. Although they are, they conserve space, right? Yeah, but I spend more time trying to figure them out. Yeah. And if you yep. just gave me a little space. And these are online journals. Why are we saving space? Oh, uh, that's. There were no good eaves question. from yellow fever, though, if I'm reading this correctly. There's no uh-huh. circle there. You're right. You're right. I think that's what those circles on the phylogenies mean. That's right. Dengue is, is there, and you have mosquito flavivirus, Aedes flavivirus, Kamiti river virus. Yeah, you're right. The West Nile? Um, no, no hmm. West Nile. Hmm. Then some nice names, self-using agent virus, <laughs> Culicetta flavivirus, and they also compared- Culicetta uh, is a kind of uh, kilocene mosquito. How about Mercadeo virus? Kamiti River. Anyway, they compare also Aedes aegypti with Aedes albopictus, and they have um, similar but not identical eaves. They don't share any specific eaves but they have overlapping sets of viral species. So it's this is a neat record of uh, previous infections. And um, as you'll see later, they're pretty recent. The time you can time these, you can get, you have ways of looking at the sequences, how far they've diverged from the viral genomes and you get a, a rough idea of how long ago. And they say they look to be relatively recent of course, that probably means millions of years <laughs> as opposed right. to hundreds of millions of years, right? You know, the the recent in, in a computational biologist term is um, quite relative. And so the, the way they think these get here is, as I said, via transposable elements because these – and one example of a transposable element would be a line element, long interspersed nuclear element, which we have lots of, like 30% of our genome. They have LTRs, and they encode reverse transcriptase, so they can move around. They make an RNA that reverse transcriptase copies it to DNA, and then it goes and integrates somewhere else in the genome. And so uh, they estimate that these are pretty recent, these um, these elements in these uh, Aedes aegypti cells. And um, they want to know what's what's where are these things integrating. And they find them in areas with lots of LTR retrotransposons in the genome. They're greatly enriched near these eaves, so they think that um, this uh, these retrotransposons are allowing these things to go into the genome, and they they can identify specific. So these are called LTR retrotransposons because they have LTRs and they encode reverse transcriptase, and they're thought to be the precursors of retroviruses. Okay, they didn't derive from them, but they actually existed a long time. They don't have an envelope gene, and then when that was acquired, they became viral. And there's some lovely names of these retrotransposons. One of them is TY3 slash Gypsy. That's, an, that's one of my favorites. There's another one that's not in this paper. It's called Sleeping Beauty. Right. It's found in fish. And the reason it was called Sleeping Beauty because it was inactive in the genome. And they repaired it, and it became active. Oh. You get it? Sleeping Beauty. I got it. Right. And now it's actually used to deliver genes and so forth. So. So the idea here is that these eaves are going into areas with lots of LTR retrotransposons. Right. right. Let me back up a minute here because, you know, you say something and it takes a long time to soak into my non-viral So you brain. want to start at the beginning? No, no, no. But I want to go back to the – I want to go In the back. beginning, there was Eve. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Just one. <laughs> And now Adam, you have thousands. No, no, no. Yeah, so go ahead. Okay. No, I, I'm, I, my mind went crazy for a moment there. I, I imagined myself as a an '80s biologist going around the world, making primary cell cultures from larvae, and then surveying for these eaves to see what viruses these uh, mosquitoes might be transmitting in those areas. Is that possible? That is exactly the experiment I wanted to see. <laughs> right. You get mosquitoes from different parts of the yeah. world. Yeah. 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 Of course. I, I, do you think they would be different enough? Why not? I, I totally agree. I just don't know. I mean, we don't have any. And the thing f- is, why a cell line? Why not just get mosquitoes? Exactly. Well, that too, but that is not being done. 
Isn't I'm Microsoft sure. doing that? No, no, don't they have a program out there to do this? Oh, yeah, the, ca- the trapping of mosquitoes in those that's uh, what they're doing. drone thingies. So yeah. I wonder what their data show in relation to this. I don't know. Well, but they, they talk a lot about how this was only possible with the long read sequencing. So are they doing long read sequencing or are they doing the short reads? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't remember. We, we talked to them on TWIV, but we did. I don't remember what they're doing. But they certainly could switch to it. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, other ticks, too, would be interesting to look at, mm-hmm. right? They, I wonder if they make eaves and so forth. Um, so, okay, so they have lots of eaves. They're a record of infection. They're in mostly LTRs. They're relatively new, and they look at this this locus. So there's you know a big locus with lots of eaves and lots of transposable elements with LTRs, and they um, say there are lots of viral sequences in these arrays, but um, they... They're a diverse set of viral families. So they think that they're, they're, you're always adding to this array and you're not just duplicating it. Because, you know, transposable elements can duplicate, obviously, when they jump around the genome. And so they think these are being added to. Okay, now the peewee comes in. You say, this looks like a peewee array. You know, there are lots of peewee RNAs were originally f- found to be defenders against retrotransposons because they move around the genome and that could be bad if it goes and it interrupts a gene. So these peewee RNAs are thought to be defenders against these mobile pieces of DNA or RNA, right? And so they're protecting us. So they say these these organizations look like peewee interacting RNA clusters. And then I started looking for papers on this, and man, there's a huge literature <laughs> on these <laughs> PI RNAs, and it's fascinating. But the nomenclature is a killer. <laughs> Because okay. they're all different kinds of proteins that are binding and different lengths of RNAs. It's really different from SI RNAs. The size of the RNAs are different and how they're derived is different and so forth. But they think that this, these uh, arrays of EVEs are, are in, in uh, PI RNA arrays. So one of the things that they do is to start, they can sequence small, very small RNAs and say, are these PI RNAs? And they infect these cells with Synbis virus, a virus that infects mosquitoes, and then they extract small RNAs, and they find that, indeed, uh, these loci are making PI RNAs. These EVE loci are giving rise to PI RNAs. And so all of a sudden you think, all right, so we have a record of previous infections. You make PI RNAs, and so that could interfere, right? Yes. With a new virus coming in. Makes perfect sense, which I think is not a PI RNA. Well, I guess they said in the beginning it's involved in defense, but... I, I don't know if this is new or not, the idea that these are derived from eaves. Does anyone know? that The, the idea that the PI It was new to me, but that means nothing. Yeah, yeah, me it, was, it was new to me as well. Um, I was not aware of that. I know that they had a paper they referenced somewhere about the importance of these in defense yeah. um, that I had some questions about, but I don't know that the relationship with eaves was already known. Right. They also said, okay, so these PI RNAs, um, are there viral sequences in them? And they find that they're, in fact, in there, in these small RNAs. They represent the genome. And uh, so that's kind of interesting that you're making small RNAs from these PI RNA clusters in, in the Eve areas, and they could be defenders. So it's a, they call it an immune archive of small RNAs. Yes, which this is what reminded me of CRISPR. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's the same idea, right? You, you build up a you build up an archive in the genome of stuff that your that your line has seen before, yeah, and yeah. then you make these little short sequences and you use those to target the uh, the incoming right. reinfections. So this is and what... we could probably talk about whether this is adaptive immunity at this point, right? So, yeah. so Brian, why would you, a... why would you there... say it's not? Um, So typically when I think about adaptive immunity, I'm thinking about um, immune memory. um, And usually we use adaptive immunity as being something that happens in response to, um, you know, VDJ recombination. You make memory cells that differentiate um, and you can take advantage of that sort of with vaccination. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, immunologists have seen a slightly different form of Um, immunity that is in um, fish that do not have jaws. Jawed fishes um, Mm. start to have adaptive immunity that we normally think of. 
uh, but we call sort of this other system that doesn't meet all of those criteria anticipatory immunity. Mm. Um, and in fact, there was even a there was a commentary with this paper as well. Um, and the commentary asked a question of whether this should be called um, adaptive immunity or whether it should be just be called um, lasting protection. Mm-hmm. Was the word that that author used pretty often? I like anticipatory. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. <laughs> and and the the thing that I associate with adaptive immunity is that it happens within one individual. You know, right? You, you absolutely. Don't, with uh, you, you can get maternal antibodies to protect the child for a short period of time. But other than that, you don't inherit your parents' antibodies. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's about Where, Whereas this is, it's a genomic change and you've got this permanent thing inserted into the genome. And now all the subsequent generations have this immunity and it's adaptive in the sense that it, it adapted this way at some point, but it's not adaptive in the sense of, of being redone for each new generation. Exactly. We don't see any evidence here of um, a mosquito being infected, sort of acquiring this new gene, um, and then suddenly being protected. Um, if right. these are, you know, quite as maybe as ancient as we think they are, uh, that's Although, not what's going on here. When when these were first acquired, that may have been what happened, right? Right. Exactly. So some some mosquito had that happen, but then all subsequent ones of that species had this mechanism in play. Uh, installed Mm -hmm. i think that's why i'd love to see it in wild mosquitoes um, yes to see if there are things going on with Mm -hmm. um, viruses that are in the field um they actually also never show us that um one of these does something antiviral that's right Mm -hmm. right right. they don't show it yeah so what they do show is that they they have they know these cells are infected with a virus the cell fusing agent virus and another bunya virus and so they look for, um, in these picoRNA libraries that they make, they look for those viral sequences and they find them. Um, so these cells are making piRNAs with homology to the viruses that are infecting them, but whether they're antiviral or not, they don't look at, right? Right, exactly. They reference um, a previous paper that showed something about that, but they don't ever show it themselves. So the, the mechanism of generation of these is quite interesting. Um, they call it the ping pong amplification. Yes. I, <laughs> yes. I spent about an hour trying mm-hmm. to figure out. <laughs> and if you read a review article, they assume you understand it already. And yeah. I found lots of diagrams of this. The, the one I found actually that does a good job at explaining it was from an annual review of uh, biochemistry, I think. And so it shows that there's a primary pathway of making peewee RNA. So these are transcribed from peewee RNA clusters, right? They associate with a peewee protein, and then they do their silencing. Um, then there's another protein called aubergine, which I just have to mention because it's a lovely <laughs> name, right? <laughs> and then there are other transcripts, I guess, which are... Uh, Anti, which are antisense that associate with aubergine, and those target transcripts. And then when you cut the transcript, that becomes a, a piRNA as well. It binds another protein, and you go back and forth and make RNAs this way, and they end up being phased. You you shift ten nucleotides every time you make you change the polarity of the strand. Okay, right. <laughs> That's why you get ten nucleotide overlaps between the. The, the the two sets of plus and minus sequences. Mm. That's the ping pong idea. I think is what is what is that sound good to uh, anyone? That, that's <laughs> the mechanism. So I asked uh, another person who does molecular biology here, um, and they found me a textbook figure, and that's what seems to be happening in this textbook figure as well. Mm, it's made it into the textbooks. Great. Yes. That's awesome. <laughs> so that this paper said ping pong amplification is unique because it couples the biogenesis of picoRNAs to target silencing. And that's different from siRNA. So they say this has the features of uh, ping pong amplification. And I have to say, I I had not heard of ping pong <laughs> amplification of small RNAs before. So I'm really sad that I missed I've missed this whole <laughs> cool aspect. You, know you just caught up. I know, that's but right. I'm. You know, you know what the thing Even is. The I've seen pia. I've seen peewee RNAs many times, and I go, I I, I don't want to. 
get into that. How, how interesting could it be? But it's fascinating. It's totally fascinating. <laughs> so the moral of the story is, if you see something new, follow it up. Okay, so these make, um, that's, that's the bottom line here, that these eaves can give rise to peewees, which in theory could be antiviral. As I say, they're capable of recognizing viruses and initiating a response, but as Brianne said, we don't know if they could or not. What would be the experiment to do to show that? Well, they could try to infect with one of these viruses that they've found. Yeah, uh, for which there are eaves in the in the which there clusters. are eaves, yeah. yes, yeah, and see if they're right. they're not able to infect, yeah, exactly. Or if the RNA is degraded, they could look at that, yeah, right. and then maybe they could pull out the eaves, cut them out, and see if the virus can then infect, right? Exactly. Yeah, that would be cool. I I suspect that experiment's underway since I'm they've sure got a cell yeah. line already. I hope so. Yeah. So I after reading this. I immediately put Andino on the list for next year's uh, seminar speakers. <laughs> so maybe you can come and talk about this. So they write in the discussion, we propose that a mosquito's evome, together with the PI RNA system, represents a potentially long-lasting branch of its RNAi antiviral defense system, which I think is appropriate. It's a proposal, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, make, and, and they say it could contribute to vector competence. The ability to right. act as a vector, right? Yeah, think about it. Um, if a mosquito has a good anti dengue virus evome, the virus is not going to replicate and it won't be a good vector, right? Right. So you said something about Wolbachia before Dixon. I did. So if Wolbachia is inhibiting viral replication, then you wouldn't get a good evome. But it may induce evomes. Why would it do that? I don't know. You think that might be its mechanism? We don't know what the mechanism is, so we could speculate what we want and be wrong. By the way, I meant to tell you that uh, when you looked at the peewees to begin with and you weren't interested, it it, it elicited the old adage, never turn up your nose at a radish. Totally, totally. (laughs) And I I agree with you. I I feel badly that I did. It's more of that, I I don't want to get into this, but then it was fascinating when I did. (laughs) Exactly. So actually, that's why I... I wanted to do this paper to, uh, to force the peewee. Got it. But so th- let's say these went in millions of years ago. I think millions. probably they, that's what they mean by millions. recent. How long have mosquitoes been on Earth? Uh, well, they have Too several. Long. That's exactly. <laughs> Helen, I couldn't have said it better. Myself. Too long. <laughs> I take it you don't like mosquitoes. No, no, they were there during the Jurassic period. They were there way before dinosaurs. Or maybe. Okay. Oh, that's hundreds of millions of years. Hundreds of millions of years. And so um, probably viruses were already around, so oh, they started getting infected cake, right away. Absolutely. Right, so my question is, how is like is today some Eve going into the mosquito well, genome that's, somewhere? That's the question you guys are asking. Yeah, 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 right. exactly. Yeah. And if this is in all these 80s and shipped on mosquitoes, then how come they're still transmitting these diseases? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the other the last thing I want to mention is that what's the what's the relationship between LTRs and EVs? And I think maybe so they're clearly associated in the sequence. So is there some mechanism that drives EVs to an LTR or, or whatever? That's something that you could look at too. So I think it's pretty provocative. Um, it is interesting. Now, the idea, obviously, the idea that we'd love to be able to work is that you could use this to render mosquitoes incapable of transmitting yeah, diseases we care about. That's mm-hmm. exactly right. But mm-hmm. how would you do a, that? Well, by by getting <laughs> this system ramped up to a point that they can't sustain a dengue infection or that they can't sustain a yellow fever infection in a, a species of mosquitoes. But it occurred to me as I was reading this that this this is a, a system to benefit the mosquito, obviously. So mm-hmm. it's going to be operating at a level that reduces or or limits damage to the mosquito. And the virus, of course, is co adapting in this process and you may simply just reach an equilibrium or we may have already reached an equilibrium, which gets to Dixon's point. Why are these mosquitoes still transmitting these viruses right. where the, the virus can replicate and get its life cycle done without killing the mosquito, which is actually the worst possible outcome that we could have. And I don't know if this system will be modifiable into one that stops really definitively stops the virus since they've been duking this out for quite some time already. Right. Yeah. One thing that I think is interesting, um, in figure one, it seemed like all of the viruses they found 
um, and Eve for were mosquito specific viruses. Um, there weren't those viruses like yellow fever or West Nile or right. viruses that are actually transmitted to us. So I wonder mm-hmm. if there is a way to um, have an Eve for one of those viruses and how Maybe. that could change transmission. Well, it may be that this particular cell line doesn't have those. But as you said, if you got wild mosquitoes, maybe you'd find them there. Well, the other question, of course, these are larvae that they're getting the cells from. Yeah. Maybe they're turned off as the larva develops an adult. Who knows? So you, you could have some stage specificity with this right. as well. Yeah. I'm thinking of, um, let, let's let's look at this broader question. Does Do these viruses harm mosquitoes in some way? That's a great question because... There are some uh, parasites like uh, Oncocerca, for instance, right. which is transmitted by black flies. If black flies acquire too many worms, they die. Mm. So there's a there's a herd immunity effect here with heavily infected people. They actually protect the people that are not infected yet because they've got so many larvae circulating. Every time a black fly bites them, they die. Well, look, if, in order for mosquitoes to transmit a virus infection, they ha- they can't be killed by it, obviously, right? Well, they so, don't live that you know, long. Dengue, they don't live very long. So in their lifespan of two weeks, maybe these these eaves dampen the uh, virus load to put it <laughs> in a way that I didn't like last no. time. Virus load, yeah. the viral the tighter, tighter. That's yes. right. Um, and so that is still enough to transmit, but yeah. it's not enough to exactly. harm the mosquito. Exactly. And in that case, that would somehow th- this has been selected to allow the virus to propagate, right? So it protects the mosquito and the virus benefits. Does that make sense? It does maybe. But um, if you t- it would be interesting to take the eaves out of a mosquito and then infect and see if the mosquito dies, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. Maybe so. That's probably in the in the works. That would be a cool experiment. Yeah, we we really never uh, anticipated this level of defense in insects. I don't think we did. Mm-mm. When Drosophila, well, who cares? It's not a vector. You know, big deal. It might be a spurious right. finding, but you know, seeing it in mosquitoes, that's a big deal. Yeah, I, and this notion that invertebrates have these complex layers of immunity, that's that's recent. <laughs> yeah, very. It, it really is. I, I actually had to pull out um, yeah. sort of a classic immunology textbook to check and see what the, the current status of some of this was. Exactly. What did we think was happening before we, we learned about these small RNAs? We had no they, idea. That they had some just some innate immunity like uh, what Dixon was talking about. Um, encapsulation. Yeah, encapsulation yeah. of pathogens and that was about uh, it. There's a they, guy... And- They've got the the TLRs, and mm-hmm. they've got apparently um, another sense, another sort of um, differentially spliced um, clusters of genes that give them a little bit of breadth mm-hmm. um, of receptors, yeah. but not much else. During during my early days at Rockefeller, before I chose a project to work on, I wanted to work on insect immunity, and so I wanted to use Japanese beetles as my model. Mm. And there's a review by George Salt that I remember. It was like. 200 pages or something like this. I think it was at the University of uh, California at Berkeley who wrote a, a, an enormous tome about immune um, mechanisms and insects that I was using as my guide. And that was back in, you know, 1964. Since then, we've just absolutely torn that up and moved forward to this kind of stuff. And, and, <laughs> you know, and, and it left all these poor, uh, I guess you'd call them immunomorphologists, that we're used to, you know, putting. Remember what Mechnikov did, right? He looked yep. at Daphnia and mm-hmm. in, in, and eating yeast. I think it was inside the hemocele of the yeast and described phagocytosis for the first mm-hmm. time. And so that's in invertebrates, and that's the, what we thought the mechanism of protection. Mm-hmm. How are you going to, you, you know, when you um, phagocytize a virus, you lose. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so this Whoops. brings up. You mentioned. Um, <laughs> Flies that transmit parasites yeah. would be interesting yeah. to see if and they... And mosquitoes do. for malaria. In this case, this is not a malaria transmitter, but it is for birds, but it's not for humans. Look at anopheline mosquitoes and see what's going on there. And if they acquire a lot of malaria, I've heard tales of the fact that they do end up dying from their infections rather than mm-hmm. uh, survive. Do do par- and, and look at ticks. Ticks as well. Mm-hmm. Do parasites... Are, are short interfering in peewee RNAs involved in defense against parasites? Who knows? How would that work? Because these are intracellular yeah, defense right. mechanisms, yeah. right? Because the viral yeah. genome is exposed. But a lot of these other parasites are too, like Leishmania. They go in the cells. 
Uh, Are they always the, encased, though? The during DNA? their development in the insect, they don't. Only in the host, only in the mammalian mm. host. So maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe this is a viral thing. Could be. So it would be interesting to look in other um, insects that do or don't transmit virus infections, right? Yeah. Yes, see, exactly. See if this is uh, there or not. But you know what it does mostly? It just forces you to think about the breadth and depth of nature. Totally. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. And I love that. There's that, not enough time to, left to read. It's fantastic. Stuff. No. Great. <laughs> and, and, right. and, and how widespread is this? In, I mean, here we have it in insects. Sure. I suggested ticks you could branch out to other arthropods. You bet. Is, is this in crustaceans? Is this, uh, you know, what... Yeah. Where where did this begin and how far does it go? How come and we don't have it? <laughs> exactly. As I was reading this, I thought, well, <laughs> there are all these eaves and mammals. Why are we not or are we not using this system? Exactly. Well, we have PICO RNAs for sure that yes. uh, prevent transposon uh, disruption of genes, right. particularly in embryos. Uh, that's right. where they were first thought to be important in animal cells because these transposons are hopping around and these peewees are, hey, stop. Yeah, uh, the only peewee I know of in humans is peewee Herman. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, about so that. we have so we have the that mac that part of the mechanism. We have the eaves. Yeah. Um, you All know, about eaves. <laughs> it looks like we, it looks like we've got the parts for it, and do they still work? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, in uh, in mammals, PICO, PIRNAs are found in testes and ovaries. In vertebrates, they're found in both male and female germ lines. Hmm. So people do study them in mice, um, zebrafish, rats, wow. C. elegans. They have a very interesting structure, too. Hmm. Anyway, that's that. That's a cool paper. Thank you, people at um, PacBio and UCSF and Stanford. Yes. it up. I, I mean, there's so many experiments that you could do, <laughs> mm-hmm. and we all know that funding is tight already. We need more money mm-hmm. to be able to do more of these things. I wonder who's well, that's, kind of, that's kind of the measure of great science, I think, is how many new questions does it generate? I want to see yeah, who supported no, this. To- NIH supported this work. Totally. Of course, there's a mosquito transmitting you know, human diseases, so I, that would be an NIH thing. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you. That was cool. Uh, let's move on to some emails. Uh, Lucian writes, Dear Twiv Masters, I was listening to episode 479 when Dixon explained BT's mechanism of action. Uh-oh. However, from <laughs> what I understand, BT is insect-specific because they have alkaline midguts. Under alkaline conditions, the protein decrystallizes, solubilizing into an active pore-forming toxin that lyses the gut. BT's activity under high pH is what renders it safe for human consumption. Our acidic stomach denatures and destroys the toxin in its inactive state. I think you said the opposite, Dixon. I did say the opposite, and I remember reading this in a Scientific American article, which was describing how the Israelis had engineered uh, BT into their tomatoes, and then mm-hmm. and the, the insects were selected against until they developed an, um, an alkaline gut tract. He provides a... Um but then they survived. They didn't a die. for this. Yeah. Okay. As I'll always, go back and check. You know, my memory is a little bit. Uh, as always, an excellent <laughs> podcast. Thank you. Lucian is a Roton. <laughs> <laughs> he actually signs his letter. A Roton. Signs wow. Roton at the Hatch Lab. <laughs> and if we didn't read this right away, he could already be done with his rotation. And, and that, for those <laughs> for those folks who are not in academia, that's a rotating student in the lab who has not picked a lab to do their PhD Roton. in yet. Yeah. I always preferred calling them rotors. That's good. <laughs> rotors yeah. a good one. I always thought of roton as being a little bit of a derogatory term too. Well, obviously Lucian does not agree with that. See that he embraces I, I it. it. <laughs> yeah, I applied it to myself. I didn't sign letters with it, but I, I applied it to myself when I was doing that in graduate school. Yeah. It was widely used. <laughs> Alan, please the next one. Sure. Brady writes, Hi, Twiv crew. As an avid listener to your podcast, I've been wanting to write for a long time. I'm a PhD student at Utah State University studying the molecular mechanisms rendering a species susceptible to New World arenavirus infection. I often listen to Twiv as I exercise to relieve the stress of graduate school. (laughs) I guess the exercise is to relieve the stress of graduate school. (laughs) Maybe yeah, both. I don't know which one, yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> while I enjoy doing this, other patrons of the gym probably find it a little weird when I start laughing at the jokes and puns that frequent the episodes. <laughs> anyway, I had the chance to meet Drs. Racaniello and DePommier last summer at the Arbo- Arbovirus Conference at RML in Montana. 
As I sat in the first row during the podcast, it was very interesting to see an actual recording of the podcast occur. Also, I hope the fishing trip went well while you guys were up there. As an avid fisherman myself, nothing is better than getting out on the river and seeing the fish bite. Thank you for the good work on this podcast. I look forward to the next episode. Cool. Yeah, we had a good fishing trip. We had a great fishing trip. I don't know if I agree with nothing is better than getting out on the river, though. (laughs) (laughs) It was fun, but uh, I don't know if I would do it all like you do it, I mean, all the time. You did it yesterday, right? I did it the day before yesterday. Yeah, I did. Now, our friend Anthony sent a photo of a poster. Right. Fact. Dogs get the flu. Don't wait. Vaccinate. I bet the dog vaccination rates are higher than human. Probably. They may be. Flu vaccination. That's why there's a flu vaccine shortage. Because you go to your vet, the vet says you're going to get a, your dog's getting a flu shot. And you don't, you don't say, I don't agree with the flu dog vaccine. Isn't, no. I don't want to put funny things into my dog. I don't want an autistic dog. <laughs> so, um, the cute little dog here. Thank you, Anthony. Right. Um, Kathy, can you take the next one? Sure. Scott writes, hello, Twiv team. I hope I'm not too late to enter the book contest. I've been honing my skills on CD400, and I finally reached a score I think could be competitive. I would be interested to hear how other people did. This game gets difficult very quickly. He got 9,430. Wow. He would have won if his entry had been in on time. <laughs> he would have won. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Came in on Saturday morning. Oh. <clears throat> So I, I also have a few questions regarding the, the glycosylation site mutation in H3N2. Specifically, that if this mutation sits on the head of the hemagglutinin and protein, wouldn't this be a disadvantage to binding of sialic acid? If so, I would assume the selective advantage would be for the decrease in host immune response at the cost of binding proficiency. But overall infectivity goes up because of the antibody, lack of antibody inhibition. I don't really know enough about sialic acid, but are the sialic acid chains that are found in the lungs of the same configuration as those found elsewhere in the body? I remember, perhaps incorrectly, a paper discussed on TWIV that looked at the 1918 flu and documented the virus's increased affinity for infecting cells in the lower lungs when compared to more modern strains, which they attributed to increased virulence. Avian influenza seems to have a configuration specificity, which I guess is why it hasn't killed us all yet. Hmm. To get to the point, this lack of antibody affinity for a virus made me think of dengue virus and the antibody-dependent enhancement. Is it possible that influenza, normally fairly fairly contained in the lungs, is now able to infect other cell types through the FC receptor and create a different disease state from the non-glycosylated H3N2? I apologize for the long email. It took me a while to get to my real question. As always, <laughs> thanks for all that you do. Oh, we've had longer emails than that. Oh, yeah. yeah it's... Uh, I'll read the PS and then we can go back and answer. PS, personally, I love the length, weather, picks, jokes, etc. that make TWIV so great. I wouldn't presume that my opinion can sway the show in one way or the other. But if the wonderful hosts of TWIV get enjoyment from the show, and obviously you give enjoyment to all of us listeners, then don't change a damn thing. <laughs> That's a great PS. I love that. It's, totally, mm-hmm. it's right, right? That's really, yeah. if we like it, just... Hey. And Scott, you could... We're going to leave all this in now because you said... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know any uh, evidence that enhancement influences what cells influenza virus infects. Mm. Yeah, there's, as far as I know, it's never been 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 considered. But the idea that the uh, the, the mutation on the head would interfere with binding—no, it's a, it's far enough away so that the sialic acid binding isn't affected. It's the antibody binding that's affected, depending on the amino acid that either. So when there's a glycosylation site, the antibody can't bind the epitope, so you can't neutralize. But the right. binding of the virus is still fine; uh, otherwise, it wouldn't be an issue. I, what what the real question is in eggs? Why do you get the change, right, in this in this mutation at the top of the HA head that uh, affects its its efficacy? And that we don't know. What is it about eggs? Yeah, two ninety four thirty. I felt bad. Maybe I, I looked around for another copy, but I only have one copy of the book. Or I'd send it. <laughs> Dixon. Yes, Stefan writes. Hey, I just discovered your podcast. I really like podcasts and also virology, so it's a great match. (laughs) (laughs) We'll tune in now regularly. I'm going to start my PhD this spring with a focus on influenza and Ebola virus cell entry using cryo-EM at the Calandra Lab in Heidelberg. I don't know if it's too late for the giveaway, but anyway, here's my high score. It's a fun little game. 
Thanks for your great podcasts. Greetings. And then he got a score of 580, so 80. he wouldn't have come no, close. No, he didn't. But thank you anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, sure. Uh, Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Joy Rell writes, Hi, everyone. I gave the game a try. I do not have a knack for it just yet. <laughs> Still, I wanted to have a chance for the book, so I am sending in a rather pitiful score with the hopes that no one else had enough time to try the game. <laughs> That's a great strategy. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's like a Jeopardy That endgame. worked for the uh, crossword. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, your podcast has been a huge influence on my decision to pursue a master's in microbiology once I have completed my master's. I spent last summer doing a research project in the Cameron Lab at the University of Regina. It was there that I discovered my true love, research. I have never been happier. Every moment in the lab makes me realize how lucky I am. I will be continuing my project this coming summer, and I'm almost giddy with excitement every time I think about it. <laughs> Excellent. Keep up the inspirational work, Joy Rao. And she got a 30 in the game. Sorry. Yes, that's a, that's about that's actually more than I got the first time. Th thank you for playing, though. Yeah, it is that's nice. To be, right. But I just this is just lovely that you're giddy with excitement. Mm -hmm. You uh, can come to my lab, sure. <laughs> where's the? You, I like giddy. Where's the University of Regina? Do you know? Does anyone know? Isn't that a city in Saskatchewan? It is. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. It is. Noah writes. I'm probably too late. I forgot that Twiv is a weekly, but here is my high score. You got twenty one hundred. Not bad. That is good. The next one's funny also. Uh, Beng sent the screen capture of the high score my daughter helped me <laughs> to achieve. She was so enthusiastic about playing because she thought Professor Racaniel is going to personally deliver the book <laughs> from New York to our house in Perth, Western Australia. Hey, why Just, not? Wow. You know what? A few more contributions and we'll be glad to do That's it. That's right. Dixon, did you read one? Yeah, you did, right? I did, yeah. Um, let's go back to Alan. All right. Peter writes, hi, Vincent and company. Here's a screenshot of my score, 1610. Love the show. It's great to listen to while well, pipetting into the night. <laughs> Keep up the fantastic work of making all the papers discussed so interesting and approachable. A fan from Trinity, Trinity College, Dublin, Ireland. Um, the, Kathy. Anthony writes, and he drops in a link for a YouTube. I was listening to a video of Noam Chomsky speaking on the evolution of language. He said, since it arose so suddenly, the mutation enabling the capacity for language must be something simple. I thought that perhaps instead, horizontal transfer delivered in a single step a complicated mechanism. <laughs> Googling language <laughs> and virus as the search terms conjured up the video of Laurie Anderson. <laughs> for what it's worth. That's worded. great. That's great. Language is a virus. And oh, Laurie Anderson is awesome. You like Laurie oh, Anderson? I love Laurie Anderson. I, I love Laurie Anderson, too. I had not heard this song. She's this, fabulous. Oh, yeah. She had, something, she had an album with scientists in the name, right? Yeah, you know who she was married science. to? Big right? science, right. Remember who she was married to? No, I don't. Lou Reed. Lou Reed. Really? Yeah. Wow, what, what an interesting conversation they must have had. <laughs> a fascinating couple. There was uh, one evening, my wife and I were on the subway when we lived in New York. We were riding home from dinner or something, and... And we were going through uh, somewhere in the village, uh, stopped at West Forth or something. A couple, yep. of, a couple got on and sat down. <laughs> and after a moment, my wife whispered to me, "Is that Laurie Anderson and Lou Reed?" <laughs> wow! <laughs> and right. I, I looked at them for a couple of minutes, and I thought, I, I said, "I don't know." <laughs> but that's entirely possible. They just look just like them, and it may very well have been them. So I'm not going to bother them, but that's. <laughs> Dixon, can you read Peter's? Peter writes, Dear professors, I am delighted to have won the Peter Hotez book. The clutch just went in on my the clutch would just went in on my car, so the timing was perfect. So stop there. I don't get it. A book is gonna make up for your clutch? Or no, he just the, couldn't get yeah, to the store. Clutch had a is bad going day in. The clutch just oh, went. a bad day. That's right. <laughs> and so getting the book made it a good day. Got it. Exactly. I, I didn't even think of that. Thanks much. very much. Please. <laughs> well, and the book does discuss transmission. <laughs> and, and you got it right. <laughs> That's right. Aberrant tra transmission in some cases. Please send to the zoology building address below. My colleagues have already asked to have a look at it after me, and I will get and I will order Peter Hotez's blue marble book as soon as I am finished to follow up. Thanks also for the information on the development of universal flu recommendation in the U.S. I will get my whole family vaccinated in the future and be better able to better inform foreign students in Ireland. Thanks again, okay. Peter. Now, here's the cool thing. 
We just had two emails from Peters who are both at Trinity College Dublin. And, and they're they different people. They don't know people. each other. They I don't know if they clue. do or not. Probably not. But, <laughs> Let's uh, put them together. I checked the email. They're different. Yeah, a fan huh. from Trinity College. And then Come this. on. So do you know each other, Peters? Two Peters, <laughs> That's right. Trinity College Dublin. That's just funny. Yep. Uh, Coincidence? I don't think so. Brianne, you're next. All right. Um, Shelly writes... Drear Twivers, I love the podcast on Arc and Dark. It arrived just after my bioinformatics class <laughs> had searched for and analyzed some human endogenous retroviruses. They already had some gag protein sequences saved. So we spent most of the period digging into those sequences and discussing the possibilities of how these had evolved. Fantastic. Thanks. <laughs> uh, Shelley Page, who is from Franklin Pierce University in New Hampshire. Pronounced like a cockney. Sh- All right, how would you say a cockney? Shall he? Just like that. Shall, shall he? he? Shall he? Shall he? Okay. Okay. We shall. Uh, my, Maya. Is it Maya or Majda? Majda. Hello, Twiv team. Thank you for the interesting episode about flu vaccine. This is our last one. I have two questions. One, is there a cumulative effect of flu vaccine protection? Is a person who gets the flu vaccine every year better protected than someone who got the vaccine for the first time? I would guess that there should be some epitopes that remain similar, at least for some time, and therefore the antibodies from one year may help during next year's. Two, you mentioned that big pharmaceutical companies do not make any money from flu vaccination. What does that mean? I guess they cannot do it for nothing. If I say it to someone who is against vaccination, it does not sound very reliable. Is it possible to find out how much money these pharma make from vaccines in contrast with other medicines? Probably not, <laughs> right? No. Um, you can. It's you, you really have to dig into financial reports. Um, but it, I think there are some larger analyses of these. There's a um, – um, uh, I'm blanking on the name of it. There's a, there's a um, pharmaceutical – industries it, it's a it's a an academic program that studies the pharmaceutical industry and its name will come to me right after we wrap the podcast up i'm sure um <laughs> but they they sometimes compile statistics you can get this information especially publicly well publicly traded companies have to disclose mm, it yeah so that is that is actually fully available um the but would they break out each vaccine though? So some companies no, don't break uh, out, right? They'll say vaccine yeah, they, sales. You know. Right. The report the report may not break things down to the level of detail that you'd like every time, but they will say in this in Sanofi in their in their annual report and and in their quarterly earnings and and such, they will discuss how much they've earned from their vaccine business and how much they've earned from this and that. Um. So you you can you can get to those data. I I know we say that that pharma doesn't make a lot of it doesn't make sometimes people will say they don't make any money from making the vaccine. That's not true. Of course, they are for profit companies. They do make money, but they don't make as much money from flu vaccine as they do from, say, coming up with the next Viagra. Mm. Uh, yeah, nobody, of course, of course, yeah. nobody is building a multi-billion dollar industry off developing a vaccine, even, you know, even one that's given every year. Uh, the the longer term vaccines are an even worse deal because people only buy them once in their life, and then you never get that customer back again for that vaccine because they're mm. done. And if you um, did a good job, you'd make your product obsolete. Exactly. If you you know, um, pity pity the folks who make a vaccine and then eradicate the virus, right? Um, <laughs> so so now uh, it's it is true that it is not a highly profitable business. And that is also why companies have not done a tremendous amount of vaccine development since the golden age of vaccinology, which could also be called the Hilleman period. Um, when the, you know, we did this whole childhood series, but that turned out to be a moneymaker for Merck, um, mainly because they built a whole business around multiple vaccines. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can make money on that and you can do that on an annual basis, but you'd make a whole lot more money by coming out with statins and other drugs that people are going to spend thousands of dollars a year on and, and take day after day. So I found a Reuters article about this. They say that Sanofi is the largest supplier of flu vaccines. Uh, in 2012, they had $1.2 billion in flu vaccine sales with a 
and they expect that to go up 50% now that's this year. What's that? That's sales. It's sales, so I don't know what so that, profit that's is. That's not but, profit. But then further down in the article, the head of Sanofi's, uh, some head at, at Sanofi, said the, the um, prices have become unsustainably low in Europe for the, right. for the flu vaccine. They're dropping, um, although then they say there's some new ones rolling out that'll help recover some of that. So There, now, are, there are some companies the, that also, um, I'm sorry, countries, that uh, that subsidize or actually make the vaccines themselves, not flu, yes. but uh, BCG, for instance, is made in Beethoven by the uh, the Dutch. So, so how would it be if the if the U.S. Uh, paid for vac- all vaccines for everybody? If it doesn't cost much to begin with, I don't. I mean, it's not, how much? Be, it's not going to be. It's not going to be hundreds of billions no, of dollars. Of no, right. And bear in mind Did that, that the U.S. Does pay that the taxpayers pay for vaccines for a large for large swaths of the population. Yeah. Everybody yeah. who's covered yeah, by right. Medicare, right. everybody who's covered under the VA, yep. everybody who's sure. a government employee. But it's uh, money well spent. Of course, it's money well spent. I'm not arguing that at but all. But other people would argue not. <laughs> I think it's a good so, question because if if someone has information about the cost, it would be nice to know. It would be. Yeah. It would so, be good to know. Yeah. yeah. I I just want to remind Amashda to listen all the way through the picks. Don't be one of those who drops off before the picks of the week because there's one pick that <laughs> may give you some numbers that talk about pharma's role in profits from vaccines. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. All right. And then the first part of the question, is there a cumulative effect? So I sent that to Scott Hensley, and he said we don't fully understand right. the cumulative effects. Most studies show you need to be vaccinated in the current season to be protected. And also remember, original antigenic sin, the very first infection you ever get makes a big big difference and we talked about this on scott's episode that if your first encounter with flu is a vaccine then that will influence how you respond later on as well so it's complicated but they're good questions okay time for some and, picks and scott scott also reiterates the point that is not a highly profitable business yeah yep. then compared to other vaccines right especially if you have to make it you reformulate it oh, very frequently and it's not yeah. it's not without risk Never. You know, you, you lose a batch, you get a bad efficacy batch like they have, well, not particularly good efficacy batch like this year. You don't know exactly what sales are going to be. So, And then, of course, the Metamune and Flumis, they're out of it this year, right? Right. But they are coming back next year. They've been good. They are still they are still approved. It's yeah, just yeah. they're not endorsed and therefore no insurer pays for them. Uh, but Flumist is now re-recommended by ASIP. And so that should be insurance covered next year. Okay, hmm. pick time. Alan, what do you have? I have a video um, about, <clears throat> it's called Ham, uh, Hawaii's Communication Breakdown. And you may have heard maybe one or two news items about this a <laughs> couple of weeks ago where Hawaii issued an alert obvious, for an like... incoming uh, missile and uh, there wasn't one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, the guy who issued that alert by accident has uh resigned and you know back to north korea (laughs) no no there was he he seems to be he seems to be a good guy oh went back to russia (laughs) he he made made an error and there there were some issues with how the alert system was set up and could easily be accidentally triggered uh but this talks about there was a it turns out there was an nbc news crew in hawaii doing they do these little documentary segments called left field where they cover some unusual thing that people might not have known about. And there was a team in Hawaii covering ham radio operators and emergency communications when the alert happened. Mm. Wow. So they've got this video uh, that does a very nice job of presenting the, the situation. And, uh, That's nice. It's cool. So that guy got the Orson Welles Award. <laughs> the Orson Welles Award. That's right. Award. Very good. I, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty cool Brianne what do you have um, I have a site called iBiology um, one of my students introduced me to this site and it has all sorts of really interesting biology videos so it has videos explaining things about antibody diversity or CRISPR or protein dynamics but also things like how to make a scientific presentation um, and advice on CVs and things like that nice. Um I'm really impressed by these videos. I actually, uh, when I was looking at the paper, went straight to this site to look and see if there was one on peewee RNAs because I thought that might help me. <laughs> <laughs> Did you find one? 
No, uh, I got a few on micro RNAs that mm. came up when I did. Why don't you search. make one? Maybe that'll be my next step. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Dixon. If you go to the site, you see a guy filming someone, just like we filmed you for the for the lectures. Yeah, this is a very well known uh, mm-hmm. thing. This eye biology that uh, started uh, as part of the. Uh, I think uh, the American Society for Cell Biology, and then they spun it off as a nonprofit. It's done very well. Neat. Dick Dixon, what do you yes, have? Well, I did have something that I put there to begin with earlier today, which was uh, the flybys by Juno, the uh, satellite that's circling uh, <laughs> Jupiter and taking phenomenal pictures of the cloud formations. Uh, but then I ran across this article just early this morning um, in Cosmos Magazine, what else? And uh, it's an article that uh, summarizes another article, which was in Cell and Host, I believe, or Cell and Host. The host right? microbe, yeah. That's right. Uh, describing the fact that bats in general, on, and only in this case they used flying bats from Australia, the flying fox bats, they had reduced or almost absent uh, interferons. Uh, and they had another gene which also was uh, involved in uh, immunity, innate immunity to viruses, which was dampened. Uh, and 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 made the speculation that this is why bats across the board are very good at harboring these highly lethal viral infections, and maybe we should be paying more attention to um, looking at their immune system and why they're so low. I saw this paper on Twitter yesterday, and I am so excited to read it this weekend. Okay, um, yeah, we'll, because we'll do it next week. These are all <laughs> um, some of the proteins that I actually work on yeah, in my lab, right. and so I really want cool. to read about this. Cool. Yeah, I said, so we should. And by the way, twenty percent of the mammals on Earth are, are bats. bats. That's right. Yes. Yeah, I think you'll be with us next week, right, Priyant? When- uh, I'm not sure about next week, but I think the two weeks after that. We'll save it for you. How's that? Oh, okay, sounds good. <laughs> it's, it's, your, it's up your wheelhouse, as they say. Yes, All right. it is. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. Kathy, what do you have? I picked something that came from the University of Michigan Engineering uh, Department. It's a video describing an article and a video describing an origami sound barrier <laughs> that should cut down on traffic noise. And it's really well done. It explains things that are relatively complicated in a way that's visually very easy to understand. And basically, the idea is that if you can have this arrangement of vertical tubes and you can adjust it, you can mm. change the the a f- frequency of traffic noise that it can block and that that's important because there's different kinds of traffic noise say in the middle of the night versus during right. rush hour and so forth and I just thought it was really well done and worth a look. Pretty cool. Hmm. So this could substitute for those big concrete barriers they put up right <laughs> mm-hmm. next to houses on highways. Oh, I so yeah, need the, the, this in an apartment I lived in in New York City. <laughs> yeah, they they describe the fact that it could help you with uh, city noise as well. Yeah. Huh. Neat. How about snoring? I don't know. <laughs> Would have to be between you and the snorer. I Would think. You use? Well, that's <laughs> traffic of the sorts. Yes. <laughs> All right, I have two picks that are related to the current gun controversy Ah. which is a gun going on for many many years but it's been amplified of course more recently by the florida incident and this is an art really nice article in gq by jean-marie lascas it's called inside the federal bureau of way too many guns and this Mm -hmm. this is basically the alcohol uh firearm and gun what is it atf alcohol tobacco and firearm division where they are not allowed to use computers to track serial numbers of guns. They have to do it all on paper and, and microfilm. you believe that? And that's so you can't track people by the serial number right. of their gun. It's a fascinating story, and the people who work there saying, you know, you think that if a cop gets a, a gun at a murder scene, they call us up and we find it on a computer right away? No, he said. We have to get descriptions, and the cops don't know one gun from another usually because they're very subtle differences, and it's just amazing that it's like this, and when they, they have so many guns they haven't yet cataloged, they're sitting out in the parking lot in metal sheds that they haven't had time to photograph, and when they need to match a serial number, they have to go through manual records. He said you have to call the store that sold the gun, and then sometimes they're out of business. It's just a nightmare. They're made, they've made it purposely hard, and if you want to get frustrated more, if you're not already frustrated by this, read this. 
they also he also talks about how there's um oh just I just got scared out of me oh that they you know they can't put the data on computers they've been allowed to change the microfilm to PDFs but <laughs> only if the PDFs are not searchable is that ridiculous <laughs> what yeah can you imagine that we are being who agreed to this Congress it's an NRA yeah. sponsored it's an yes. NRA they're doing the whole thing can you are, imagine regulating cars this way. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can search your VIN online and find out your horse. Right. Come on, let's right vote now. these people out of office. And then, then in addition, I also found today, this is from a, a website I read. This is an article in The Atlantic by a uh, uh, radiologist who saw the, um, the, the CTs of the, some of the kids. And they said these bullets completely shred the liver, yeah. for example. Uh, unlike a regular book bullet that just passes through, they would open up one of these kids and you can't do anything because the liver's gone. And this is CDC is not allowed to uh, do research into the effects of these high velocity bullets. They're prevented by the same kind of legislation by the NRA. Because if people realized what these bullets were doing, um, they would definitely be against them because not enough people are against. So this said, as a doctor, I have the duty to inform the public of what I has lear have learned it's clear that these high-velocity weapons have no place in a civilian's gun cabinet. But the CDC is not allowed to do research into this or publicize it. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. This is why the Don't NRA is so reluctant to allow the CDC to research gun violence. The facts would be devastating. Benson, do you remember how long it took to get seatbelts legalized? Yeah. And but who, they did. They got them. Yeah, out. they did, though, but it took a long time. It's just it's just stunning that something so clear is being stymied by a group. How about um, <laughs> fluoride in the drinking water? Yeah, I understand, but it's it's Hang very on. it's very sad. So have have you heard of this um, psychologist? I think he's from Harvard, but he might be from MIT. He's got long curly white hair, and he's a very thin kind of guy, but he has a big sparkle in his uh, eye. And he was on NPR last night, and he produced a book called Enlightenment Now. Mm -hmm. And it's become a huge underground and now an overground bestseller. And it said things have never been better than they are today. And he was challenged by the economist on, online. And, and he went through a whole bunch of things and said, no, this is better. This is better. This is down. This is down. This is down. You know, like automobile accidents and deaths mm -hmm. from auto. And, Steven and Pinker. That's mm -hmm. the guy. That's the guy. And, you know, it's hard. He, and he said it's hard to come to grips with this kind of a situation and still realize that things are better than they were because things don't look better than they are. Mm -hmm. they, they, they look horrible. You know, you're, this is an egregious thing that needs to be corrected. But the, the, the part that bothers me so much is when a person just, yeah. you know, they, have, yeah. they want to support this you, for, for reasons that have nothing to do with what's right. right? You know exactly they why they're change. doing it. You Crazy. know exactly why. So anyway, those are articles to get you more burned up. <laughs> burned up already. <laughs> and we have a listener pick from Johnny. Gentle <gasps> folks, to add to the collection, enjoy Boston 9 Seed Light Drizzle, and Johnny sends a YouTube video, which Kathy has some comments on it. So, yeah, I watched it. It's, it's a good one. It's a, a whiteboard drawing type video about vaccines. And so if you watch this, Majda, um, it has some information about uh, pharma's profits from vaccines and some compensating cost right. savings to society of having people vaccinated. Which that's an aspect that I should have mentioned above with the economy of vaccines as well is the, the net effect of vaccinating people is enormous. Yeah, for 50,000 deaths this year, that's a lot of hospitalization beforehand. Yes. And that when you when you calculate that in uh, disability adjusted life years and then correct for, you know, uh, incomes of people who were who would have been lost or who would have lost work. Uh, we're, we're talking billions upon billions of dollars in the economy that have been added by this product, this category of products. But to paraphrase uh, Charlie Hauser, a federal agent with the ATF, he's quoted in this article. People don't think, end quote. Yeah. Of course, TWIV listeners all do. Mm -hmm. Yes. It sounds like a Yogi Bearism. Yeah. <laughs> all right. TWIV 482, Apple Podcasts, microbe.tv slash TWIV. If you listen on a phone or a tablet, you're using an app. You could just search for TWIV, subscribe, and get every episode because you want every episode. They're all 
informative, and sometimes there's a joke or two, which can, <laughs> which can lighten things up. Always the weather. <laughs> and if you want to uh, help us out, microbe.tv slash contribute to help support the growing family of podcasts. We'll make West Australia yet. <laughs> yeah, we could go deliver the book to the winner. That's right. Dixon right. Pommier can be found at Parasites Without Borders. Dot com And also, you have to go look at thelivingriver.org if you haven't. Uh, is that where? Now, there was another place where you had photographs of your. It's called uh, depommierphotoart.com. Oh, yes. That's another good one. Depommierphotoart.com. We've added some animals recently. Animals in Africa, your latest African. That's trip. right. They're beautiful. You might like them. Uh, especially the hyenas. They're cute. I love the hyenas. They're great. On film. They're great. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. Brianne Barker is at Drew University and on Twitter, Bioprof Barker. Thanks, Brianne. Thank you. This was really wonderful. Glad to have you back. It's great to be back. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This was a lot of fun. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. You can find him on Twitter as Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. My thanks to ASM and Ronald Jenkins for his music at ronaldjenkins.com. Been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Let's see for titles here. Pee-wee's Big Adventure. That is pretty funny. I love it. Is that yours? No, it's Alan's. Alan's? I like Aedes and Eve. Yeah, I just, that was the one I did. It's like my once a year clever thing. Do you get it, Dixon? Aedes and Eve? I do, I get it. Do you have a favorite, Dixon? I do. Pee-wee's, Pee-wee's Big Adventure? Pee-wee's Big Alan, which one do you like? Pee-wee's Big Adventure? Pee-wee's Big Adventure or Don't Eve Home Without Antibody Express. That's pretty funny. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what's in your wallet? <laughs> yeah. Don't leave home without American Express. Yeah. That also yeah. hits both. That also hits both of them. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Kathy? Like that. I hadn't seen that one before. I like the Don't Eve Home Without Antibody Express. Yeah. Brienne? Um, I like Don't Eve Home Without Antibody Express and Pee Wee's Big Adventure. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, That's boy. why we have five people on this show, <laughs> because you never get a tie. <laughs> what do we have, like half and half or something? Except that people were voting for two. Yeah. You can only vote for one. Dixon? Pee-wee? Pee-wee. Pee-wee has one. Uh, Alan? Don't eat home. <laughs> Brienne? Don't eat home. Kathy? Don't eat home. Don't eat home one. Oh, dear. There we go. Even without me, right? <laughs> Don't eat home without antibody expressed.